much for being here. And for those of you that are joining us online, we're so excited to have you here too. If you're new with us or even joining us online today, we hope you feel right at home. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service, and we know there's a perfect place for you here in the family. The easiest way to get connected is to fill out a blue connection card you can find in the seat back pocket in front of you and drop it in a drop box in the lobby on your way out after service. Or even easier, you can text us. You can text NEW TO GATHERING to the number 97000 and we'll reach out to you this week. Hey, thanks again for being here this morning. Make sure you stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook and Instagram. We know God has something unique for each of us this morning, so let's prepare our hearts now to worship Him together. church family. And I, I always think about what should I say up here? I always try to come up with something good, but I was just thinking about this last week. I felt so convicted. Just Jesus is enough. I felt like in a day and age where we're always looking for something better, something greater, something more, uh, just don't get used to Jesus. He is enough. So let's sing to him this morning. Let's let him know how, how awesome he is and how much we love him. That a day was signed, surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, and Sunday's empty too. Since when has impossible ever stopped you?
give him a shout of praise. We're going to do that new song again this Sunday. It's called Ruins. It's just all about what God can do through the midst of terrible things. And it's also just a, a visualization of what God's, God does through us when he, uh, when he saves us. Look around and all I see Burning buildings, bearing trees Hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc. Son of man, I know you see the deepest depths unknown to me. You have planted seeds among the ashes. You rebuild, you restore all that's broken. From the ruins, you redeem, you restore all that stolen from your children. That's what you do. So be still, my anxious heart. All that's gone is never lost. Manuel is here and he is faithful. So I won't let my praises stop. I sing it from these rubble rocks. Cause I know you are good and you are will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down deep 
into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long, how high and how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from our God. Now all glory be to God, who is able, through his mighty work out through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or imagine. Glory to him in this church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is, this is the truth of what God wants to do in and through his people. Like He is a good dad that wants to give his kids good gifts. And one of the, the best, the best gift that God gave to his children is sending his only son to live a sinless life for us so that we could be redeemed to relationship with our Father again through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's what we're going to celebrate in this moment together as we take communion. So if you're here in this place and that's your story, if you have given your life to Jesus, if he is your Lord, then we're going to come forward and celebrate that together in this moment. And if you're here this morning and, and that's not your story yet, if, if you haven't chosen yet to trust that God has the best plan for your life, to put, to put your life in his hands, then it's our prayer that even at, if you stay at your seat in this moment, which I promise we won't look at you funny or anything like that, but it's our prayer that, that you would experience the real Jesus in this place, that you would experience the life and the joy and the purpose and the calling that he has on your life. So that's our prayer for you this morning. If you call the gathering home, you know what we're going to do. We're just going to come forward in our sections and we'll grab the bread and the cup here at the front. We'll take them back to our seats and take them together in the middle of this next song. If you are new here, welcome home. I promise if you just follow somebody, you will end up in the right place. And family, let's just help out where it's needed. You guys can come forward. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the Lord and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. to the other side and this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you
multitudes and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. When the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit the flame, now this gospel truth the Lord shall Christ who has resurrected me. Ooh. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, free in one. God of glory, first Sunday with us. We hope you feel like you're part of this family here with us today. Um, if you wouldn't mind just grabbing one of those connection cards in the seat back pocket in front of you, fill that thing out and leave it in a drop box in the lobby on your way out after service. We would just love to be able to connect with you this week and pray for you. And if God's calling you to be a part of what he's doing in and through this church, then we just want to make sure that you have all the information you need to make that decision. Um, you can also just text us. You can text new to gathering to the number 97,000 and we'll get you all the same information that way. Um, whether this is your very first Sunday or you've been hanging out with us for a little bit, if you haven't been through something yet that we call Connect, we just want to take a second and invite you to join us for the month of August. What it is is just a three-session introduction to who we are as a church and how you can find your purpose in God and your calling and what he's called us to together as a church. Um, so if you would like to get signed up for that in the month of August, just grab one of those paper connection cards and put on it how many of you are going to be coming so we can be prepared for you. And we would love to see you in August. It happens right down the street at Norm's Coffee Bar. So don't miss out on that. Um, hey, I also just wanted to take a second. We had a very fun Sunday here last week with Splash Sunday for our kids. So can we just give a hand to all the people in the yellow t-shirts? Because they gave up their time and their talent to just take care of those kids out there in the back and make sure that they got to experience Jesus in a fun way last week. So we also don't want to miss the opportunity to thank you for your ties and your offerings because that made a way for so many of the fun things to happen back there and we got to do that together for our kids here at the church and also for some other kids just throughout the community that got to come and experience who Jesus is in a new way, in a fun way, in a fresh way that maybe their families hadn't experienced before. So we're so thankful for you for that. If you came prepared to give today, we just want to let you know we have three easy ways to do that. You can give um, with an offering off an offering envelope right in front of your seat or you can also just give on your phone on the church center app or online at yourgathering.church but we just wanted to thank you guys for your continued faithfulness your generosity um, in helping us be able to do fun things like that around here um, if you haven't noticed yet, Pastor Brandon and Rachel are actually away this weekend. They got invited to come preach at, Brandon got invited to come preach at a summer camp this week. So that is where they are. Um, but we actually get to hear a message from one of our favorite pastors. His name is Earl McClellan. He is a pastor at Shoreline City in the Dallas area. Um, but this message that we get to see today is actually a message that he just preached not that long ago at Christ Fellowship in Florida, where Pastor Greg and Cynthia were actually on staff. So we have some connections with them. They are super gracious to let us watch this message this morning. So let's just settle in and prepare our hearts for kingdom culture versus cancel culture. We have been in a series called TikTok Theology. 
Now, this has been fun. How many of you actually have TikTok? Oh, every location has TikTok. Yeah, I, I didn't think many of us did. I actually don't have TikTok either. My wife periodically will ask us to do some TikTok dance, and I am not interested in doing those dances. But but this TikTok theology, there is some word, there, there's, a, there's a culture that's out there in this world. There's a way that people are doing things, and today we're going to dig into the Bible, and I think all of us are going to to be pushed forward. If you have your Bibles, why don't you open up with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to read some words from Jesus here. These words may be new for some of us, but no matter where you are on the spiritual journey today, all of us are going to be pushed forward in our walk with God. Matthew chapter 5. Let's start reading in verse 21. Jesus says this, okay? You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject, subject to judgment. Verse 22. But I tell you, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoa. Okay, let's keep on going. Let's go to verse 27. We're not going to like this verse. Uh, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, everybody say, but I tell you. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Just keep looking straight right now. Just keep looking straight. Verse 43. Again, I'm not making this up. You can read this in your own Bible. You can go to your own phone right now. I'm not, these are all right here. Okay, I did not put this in here. And it's in red. You have heard that it was said, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse number 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I like that. Some of us would like to put in there, love your neighbor, hate your in-laws. But... Sometimes those words can be interchangeable, enemy and in-laws. But I tell you, love your mother-in-law and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, here is Jesus, and he is setting a pretty high standard for all of us. He says, you're used to this standard. But I tell you, here's the standard. This standard's okay for you. You're accustomed to living this standard. But I tell you, there's another standard. You, you decided, and rightfully so, because you read this, you should not commit adultery. But let me go ahead and take it up a notch for you. Anyone who looks lustfully at a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Oh, boy. <laughs> Repent. You know, right, right now we feel like don't let shame. I don't want no shame, okay? No shame on any shoulders. No guilt. No condemnation. That's not the type of church we are here at Christ Fellowship. We're not here to put any shame, any guilt on you at any location, no matter where you are around the world. No shame, no guilt. What Jesus is trying to do here is he's actually trying to draw all of us closer to him. He's not trying to push us further away. In this moment here, Jesus is not trying to say, I don't want you near me. He's actually saying, you can't do it without me. What he's trying to do is get us to a place where we will no longer just look at how other people are living and look at the standards of this world and say, okay, I can do that in my own power. What he is saying is, son, daughter, in order for you to live the life that I've called you to live, in order for you to be who I've called you to be, in order for you to be the reflection of the kingdom of God, I'm going to need you to understand that I'm going to set the standard so high that you can't do it in your own strength and power, that you will actually need my grace, my spirit, my provision, my love, my mercy, my empowerment in order to do it. 
So here Jesus is painting a clear picture. Now, if Jesus is doing that in his day, how about our day? I mean, in our day, there are some ways that people live and they say, this is okay. For instance, if you write a post on Facebook and, um, I don't know, you write a post about a vacation you are on, and then you have somebody uh, put, make a comment on your post about how you, I don't know, got buck teeth. Let's just throw that one out there. <laughs> well, your smile's crooked. Oh, 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 your family, you guys can go here. I haven't been on a vacation in years. I don't know, just something where it's like, what? I'm here just trying to celebrate my family. I'm just trying to let the world know we're having a good time. And then this friend, for, ex-friend from high school has the audacity to put some nasty comment where I'm just trying to bring some light to the world. Now they want to bring some shade. They want to rain on my parade. Oh, really? Well, let me go to you. Can you feel it already? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? It feels right. <laughs> It feels almost justified. It feels as if like God wants me to do this. Lord, would you give me the words to cut them up one side and down the other? Would you help me, Lord, to let them know that I'm better than them? Would you help? But Jesus says the world does things one way. But I tell you. I do things another way. In our day and age, um, when someone makes a mistake, when someone falls, when someone stumbles, it can be very, very public very quickly. And when someone makes a mistake in our day and age, what we do is cancel them. We cancel them. We try to do all we can to destroy that person's life. The news cycle will bring up things from when they were 16, 17, 18 years old. Do you want someone bringing up everything that you said when you were 16, 17, and 18 years old? But we are A-OK -okay in our society, taking the shortcomings, the stumblings, the moments when someone fell years ago holding that against them and not giving them an opportunity to be all that God has called them to be. But the kingdom of God is different. The way of Jesus is different. What our Savior does is he gives new opportunities to people who made old bad decisions. What our Savior does is he keeps on restoring and he keeps on coming after and he keeps on saying, son, daughter, when you turn, my arms are right here. As a matter of fact, I'll be pursuing you. I want, to, I want us to go to a passage of Scripture. Maybe you've read this before. It is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. We will not read all of these verses because I want to show you two texts, one from the Old Testament and hopefully one from the New Testament. And both of them carry the same spirit because the title of today's message, because it's Father's Day, is the head of the table. The head of the table. That's where I like to sit. Go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Again, if you don't have your Bibles, we're going to put the words on the screen so that you can follow along with us. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, uh, verse number 1. We'll just set it up. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, maybe you've heard of David. If you have not, let me just catch up to speed real quick. He uh, was a ruddy guy, and he was a younger brother. Uh, so some of y'all know what that's like, because you're the younger brother, and he got looked over a bunch of times. But God had called him to be the king. This is the same David of David and Goliath. You know, he had the sling and the stone, and he threw and hit Goliath in his head. And then after, you keep on reading the story, he actually cuts Goliath's head off. It's in the Bible. <laughs> 
holds it up. <laughs> Who said the Bible's boring? So he holds it up. This is like the movie 300. You remember that movie from back in the day? This is Braveheart before Braveheart. He's William Wallace, like, ah, for the glory of God. <laughs> So that same David has now become uh, king. He had a friend named uh, Jonathan. Jonathan was in line to, to actually have the spot that David has, but God had picked David. So now Jonathan, his friend, has died. Saul, the old king, has died. And any time the old king, uh, a new king comes into power, he would tend to kill off all the line of the former king. Would kill him. This is, you know, just like in the movies. Like, I don't want you trying to come and take my throne, so I'm going to go and kill you. So J David now is sitting there on his throne, and he says, is there anyone left of the old line to whom I can show kindness? I don't want to kill him. I don't want to cancel him. I want to show him kindness. There was a standard, there was a way kings did things. But David shows up, and he does it in a different way. One of the servants shows up, and this guy's name is Ziba, and if your name is Ziba, God bless you. Uh, I don't know anybody named Ziba, but, but, but I'm sure it's a wonderful name. Ziba's standing there, and Ziba says, I know somebody. His name is Mephibosheth, and he lives in this place called Lodabar. Now, Lodabar uh, that does not maybe mean anything to us, but the name actually means like nowhere. His son Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son Mephibosheth, is living in a spot called nowhere. That, that's, that's where he's living. No pasture. Some people say it was like a ghetto in biblical times. He is living in nowhere. And the king is interested in finding this young man to show him kindness. Now, you don't have time to go here right now, okay? Uh, but later on, you can read 2 Samuel chapter 4, and you can read what happened to Mephibosheth. You'll find out that when the old kings died, when Saul died, and when Jonathan died, the nurse picked up Mephibosheth when he was five years old and started running with him to hurry and leave because she didn't want anyone to kill him. And when she's running with him, she stumbles. He falls. And at five years old, he becomes disabled. He goes from a little boy, playing, living life, to in a moment he is dropped. And the moment that he's dropped, it changes his life forever. Amen. I just wonder if we've forgotten what people actually go through in life. I wonder if we've forgotten that real people go through real problems real pains, and real struggles. Like what, what it's, e it's easy for us to look at someone and to think because they are this color or went to this school or drive this car that maybe they've always had it together. But if you could pause for just a little while, you might know that somebody got dropped when they were five. And when they were dropped when they were five years old, it just changed their whole life from that point on. Like maybe the reason they don't trust men is not just because they're mean and nasty. Maybe men were mean to them when they were five, six, or seven years old. So anytime a guy gets close, that's why she pushes guys away. Maybe the reason your coworker can't stand to have a boss is because every single boss your coworker has ever had has always demeaned and hurt and disrespected him or her. Maybe individuals are how they are, not because they want to be nasty. Maybe something happened to them that was not even their fault, and now they are living their life with a limp, and they wish they didn't have the limp, but they have the limp. And I'm just wondering, are there 
any kings out there that are willing to be like this King David and like our King Jesus and say, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. And I'm not coming to cancel you. I'm coming to bring you kindness. So now, 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 uh, David, David uh, sends for Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth hears about it. I cannot imagine what's going through Mephibosheth's mind. He's now thinking, wait, why does the king want to see me? Why does the king want, matter of fact, this is what the Mephibosheth says. Go with me all the way down to, ooh, let me pick a verse. Okay, look at this in verse number six. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. David had to tell him, don't be afraid. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore don't be afraid. You're going to be restored. And then he says, you will always eat at my table. You will always eat at my table. Come on, every campus, you got to stay locked in right here. You will always eat at my table. Do you know what Mephibosheth says back? He didn't say, oh yeah, I deserve it. It's about time. I heard that you and my, my father were close and I've been over here living in Lo Debar. I've been over here living in the ghetto and you forgot about me. No, doesn't say that. He says, verse number eight, he bowed down and says, what is your servant that you should notice? A dead dog. Like me. I think we think people in culture who are mean on Instagram and mean on Twitter and mean on Facebook and mean at work, I think we think they're at home thinking of ways to be mean. But in actuality, I think they're sitting at home hating themselves. And because they don't love themselves, why do we think they'll be able to love you? So now we have the king, and he says, you're always going to be at my table. You keep on reading here, uh, and, and David says it multiple times. He says, you're going to be at my table. You're going to be at my table. You're going to sit with my sons. You're going to sit with my sons at the table. And I was just thinking, what do the other sons think? Because they already have their spot at the table. If they have their spot at the table, and now somebody else is about to come into the table, well, that means I'm going to have to move. So David here, I think, represents Jesus sitting at the head saying, I want to show kindness. We are the sons sitting at the table, sons and daughters sitting at the table. And now we've got somebody coming to the table who wasn't originally at the table. And it's like, well, if they're coming to the table, do I? I like my spot. <laughs> Wait, does that mean I have to move? Wait, does that mean I have to give? Wait, does that mean I need to serve? Wait, does that mean I need to make room? And it's interesting when you have your spot at the table, you're happy with your spot and you don't want to let that spot go. But you maybe forgot and maybe I forgot that there was a day that I was not at the table. There was a day I was over here and someone else had to move to make room for me. So now we're talking about our friends in the correctional facility and we're letting you know one day when you get out, there's a church family that's saying, hey, we're going to make room for you. Why do we have summer camps? We're trying to let teenagers know. We're trying to let kids know that, hey, you don't have to grow up for us to make room for you. We're going to do it right now. We're going, hey, we'll move if we need to move so that you can have a spot at the table. 
Why do we keep doing things with foster care? Why do we keep on serving how we're serving? Why do we keep on praying how we're praying? Why do we spend time in worship? This is not just so that we can secure our spot. It's so that we can know, hey, King, what do you need us to do? And if there's someone with lame feet, I need you to know, King, not only will I make room, I'll get up from the table. And I will go. And I'll be the one to pick them up. And I'll carry them to the table. So here, Jesus being like David, typing a shadow, saying, hey, I want to take people that have fallen. And from a lack, lack of a, you know, sounding corny, can't get up. <laughs> I'm going to take them. And I want to invite them to the table. You ever go into an elevator and, uh, and you, you, know, you push the button and it opens up and it's full? And everybody in the elevator is like. <laughs> and you're like, ah, sorry, but I, I got, I got. And you squeeze in, everybody else has to go. <sighs> now you got people's hot breath on your neck, and nobody's looking at each other. Everybody's looking straight, but they can just feel. And then now you're like, ah, well, at least I'm in. And then it goes down one floor, stops again. And there's somebody else standing there looking into the elevator. And now you're in. <laughs> so you're like, Really? You can't see this is full? You, you can't see that there's no more space here? Now, one floor earlier, we were the ones like, sorry, <laughs> sorry. It just takes one floor for us to go from outsider to insider. It takes one floor for us to go from, oh, I'm so sorry, to I can't stand you. And I just... I just am thankful for the spirit and the heart that is already here at Christ Fellowship. But be careful. The world has a culture. The news media has a culture. TikTok has a culture. Uh, Facebook and, 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 and Instagram, they all have a theology. And they're trying to tell you it's us versus them. They're trying to tell you you can't trust them. They're trying to tell you they're out to get you. They're trying to tell you that you're going to lose everything. But I'm trying to let you know Jesus says we we already lost everything when we started following him everything anyway everything we have belongs to him anyway so since everything belongs to him let's go ahead and extend grace and mercy and kindness and truth and mer the way he's called us to and let's make room at the table instead of saying instead of saying uh you know there's no seat Let's be a church family that says, that says take my seat. Hey, take, take, take my seat. 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 If your campus is overflowing and you got people coming in, we're not going to be the one. Oh, that's, that's my chair. That's my, what do you, what do you do? No, 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 no. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on. Because this was somebody else's chair before I ever got here. Even those of us who have been in this church for 30 years, let us be the ones that go first. Let us be the ones that say, hey, I'll get up first. Let us be the ones that say, I'm willing to make room right now. Let us be the ones that are saying, God, if you're bringing them, I will do everything in my power to make sure they have a seat at the table. Because it's easy to be at the table and criticize everybody who's not. And please, once they get to the table, let's not be surprised that they don't know all the table rules. Okay? Let, let, let's, just, let's just not be shocked that they're eating with their hands. Taking the plate. 
literally have a, have a young lady on our staff team. We love her so much. She didn't do this with the plate. I mean, she, did, she didn't do that. Um, but, I mean, we're at the nicest. I mean, this wedding is so nice. It's, it's at the Ritz. It is so nice. This couple has this full course. I mean, it's like four or five course meal. This wedding is incredibly expensive. And we are there at the table. This a couple in our church got married. And I'm not going to say the person's name who's on our staff. But she is there. And we are eating the food. And some people didn't finish their food. And she starts saying, hey, you're not going to finish that? And she starts taking people's food off of their plate, putting it in her purse. I love... Uh, 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 uh. I can't say her name. I almost said her name right there. D don't, don't, don't do that here. Okay, don't do that here. At a restaurant, yeah, but, but here, we're, we're not going to do that. Oh, I, I, I don't know. Just, I, I don't want it to go to waste. Well, she, she didn't know the rules. Let's not be surprised that when someone hasn't been sitting at the table for their entire life that they don't understand the rules. When we say the book of Matthew, they don't even know what we're talking about. When they say lift your hands in church, they have no idea what we're talking about. When, 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 when we say Jesus loves you, they might not really understand all that we're talking about. What we do as the followers of Jesus is we make space, we make room, and we allow them the opportunity to sit at the table and begin to learn what it means to be at this table. That you're no longer some dead dog. That you're now a son and a daughter of all almighty God and Jesus has been pursuing you your entire life oh, okay 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 I told you I was gonna give you Old Testament and New Testament uh, let, let, let me give you this one let me give you this one too okay because I, I just want to make sure we got texts on both sides to say we're not canceling we're kind we're, we're not we're not pushing people away from the table we're making space for them at the table Look with me. Look with me in uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Maybe you've heard this story. If you haven't, here it is. Luke chapter 19, verse number one. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Watch this. Now we get some descriptions about who Zacchaeus is. He was a chief tax collector. He was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was, now this is kind of rude, but you know, the Bible's just saying what the Bible says. He was short, and he could not see over the crowd. Okay, so he's a tax collector, he's wealthy, he's interested in Jesus, but he's short, and now the crowd is in his way. Huh. He's wealthy. He's a chief tax collector. He's interested in Jesus. I don't know why sometimes, you know, we just think that it's only poor people that are interested in Jesus. But there's a lot of really wealthy people out there wondering is there a place for them too? They're wondering am I going to be judged? Because I have means? Is there space for me too? Again, I'm so glad we're in the correctional facilities. That's so beautiful and wonderful. And I'm so glad we can continue to go after the poor, the outcast. I think that's all biblical and wonderful. But this man, he had money but was still poor. He had wealth but was still lost. So he's there. And he can't see Jesus because of the crowd. I just wonder, are there people that are interested in trying to get to Jesus, but the crowd of the church has been getting in the way of them trying to see Jesus? So maybe we don't have to post everything we think. Because maybe we think what we post is just posted in a vacuum. But little do we know that there's a Zacchaeus in our life that's watching what we post and what we put on Facebook, what we put on Instagram is actually getting in the way of them seeing Jesus. 
hey, I'm all for us standing up for rights. I'm all for us being vocal. I'm all for us being involved in politics and in business and in the world. I think it's necessary. I don't think God has asked us to disconnect from the world. But friends, we are the ones that people look at to figure out what Jesus is like. And there's no one else coming. It's us. So you probably got some anger towards someone, some group, some family member, some coworker. Shoot, if you don't, then you're just like Jesus. Probably Pastor Julie does it because she's so holy and righteous and pure. She's like an angel. <laughs> but for the rest of us, <laughs> there's probably someone when they start talking, we're like, oh, I can't stand. I, I wish they would. If I saw them, it... and I wonder if Jesus is saying, yeah, if you saw them, would you do what I did? Because what he did in this story, in verse number five, he's, he says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I'm coming to your table. He gets there to the table. I don't know what the interaction is. We don't hear all their conversation. But what we do know is there's this radical transformation that takes place in Zacchaeus' life. We know that this man goes from lost to found. He goes from blind to seeing. He goes from wandering to being home. And what our Savior did with Zacchaeus is what he's called you and I to do in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in politics, in business, in medicine, in athletics, at our universities. This is what he's called us to do. This is the mandate of the church. And there is no greater honor than to say, God, use my life for your glory. If you wouldn't mind, friends, bow your head at every location. Bow your heads for just a moment. If you're online, if you're sitting by yourself or you're in a row of a bunch of other people, bow your head for just a moment. If you're under the sound of my voice and you have never given your heart and your life to Jesus, right now you would say you're not at the table. Or maybe, maybe you would say there was a day you were at the table, but you slipped away and you've gone another direction and maybe you're living in Lodabar. You're in a place called nowhere and you're feeling like you're all by yourself. And today God is saying, son, daughter, I have not forgotten about you. I know you by name. I want you to come home. If that's you at any of our locations, whether you're man or woman, tall or short, whether you have your PhD or your GED, if you have never given your heart to Christ or at one point in time you didn't, you slipped away, and today you want to give your heart and your life to him on the count of three. I want you to do something simple, but something bold. I just want you to throw your hand in the air and say, yes, that's me. I want to give my heart and my life to Christ. Ready? One, two, three. Just put your hand up in the air. You're saying, yeah, that's me. I want to give my heart and my life to Christ. Friends at all of our locations online is saying, yes, I want to give my heart and my life to Christ. This is beautiful. I'm going to ask everyone, do me a favor, put your hand over your heart if you would not mind, every person. And I want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I admit I made mistakes. And today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Give me the power to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we lift our heads up? Come on, clap our hands at every location. Hey, can, can we all just stand to our feet this morning? We don't want to miss an opportunity to just recognize and celebrate with those of you who might have prayed that prayer for the first time today. Um, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us some of those connection cards and let us know so we can be praying for you and celebrate with you in the coming weeks. Um, man, we are so proud of you if you chose to put your life in Jesus' hands today, this morning. So let's just continue celebrating and honoring and praising Jesus. We're going to continue worshiping here together this morning. the 
church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth alone shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. to just meet you and give you a gift and shake your hand. Um, For the rest of us, we'll see you back here next Sunday. You guys are dismissed.